Hello, I'm Keith Fox and here we are in the evening of Sunday the 27th of August at the ESC Congress. This is the wrap-up, but what I want to do is discuss with Stefan Achenbach and with Barbara Cassidy about some of the highlights of today. You've both been very busy, so Stefan, it was hard to get people into the main uh, hotline session. They were sitting on the floor. People were indeed sitting on the floor. The room was full, it was more than full. People were queued up before the entry doors to the hotline session number one. So it was really not only the volume of people wanting to go in there, but also the things that happened in this session where really they had historical dimensions. So, so this is an exciting session. And Barbara, it, it contrasts with what a uh, prominent commentator said just a couple of months ago, said that uh, cardiology is in the doldrums. Nothing exciting is coming on. Uh, that's absolutely wrong. We've yeah. had a, a hotline today that is going to change our understanding and change our practice. And I want to start with inflammation because there have been attempts to modify inflammation in the past that have failed. But Cantos has succeeded. Why? Inflammation is very complex. So, you know, reducing inflammation is not like saying it. You know, you can reduce inflammation in ways that includes platelet aggregation, for instance, and so that is not going to be good. Uh, what it is the constant, uh, though, that if you are messing up with cytokines, you're going to reduce inflammation, you're going to affect atherosclerosis as uh, an, an cardiac event, as uh, Cantos has shown, but you are also increasing sepsis. Okay, so uh, how concerned should people be about sepsis and fatal complications of sepsis? So there is a small excess in fatal sepsis uh, that is more than uh, compensated by a 70 to 80 almost percent reduction in the mortality of lung cancer. And that is, uh, if you... Hang on, we get it, we'll get to lung cancer in a moment. I know you want to talk about cancer. We'll get to lung cancer in a moment. But let's talk about what the a, cardiovascular. What an added value. We're I mean, it's a phenomenal added value. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think it's really about the order of magnitude, right? Yes. yes. We do see an increase in what they call fatal infections. Yes. But the order of magnitude Small. that we see... It's in trivial compared it, to the benefits. Yeah. Exactly. So this is a monoclonal... That's actually a thing about relative risk and absolute risk, right? Yes. That you're talking about yeah. here. So, so this is a, a monoclonal antibody, and it tells us that we need to be alert, as a lots of people in vascular biology have always said, yeah. that this is an inflammatory process. Yes. Yeah. But we just didn't have the tools to dissect it. Yes, but we know that the interleukin, there are both uh, uh, experimental signal and genetic signal that points to the interleukin-1, interleukin-6 pathways. Yes. And so the, the hypothesis was robust, but it just needed to be tested, you know, and Cantus has tested it. And at a great peril, you know, you are uh, affecting something that may or may not work or may reduce uh, uh, cardiovascular events, but then may in cause other complications. And so there is a significant reduction in cardiovascular events, mostly uh, myocardial infarction and, and revascularization uh, uh, with a very small, much smaller signal on stroke. And uh, there is a slight increase in mortality of sepsis. Uh, overall, the trial has not shown a reduction in all-cause mortality, um, but uh, there is also, you know, a 50% reduction in event, a 70% reduction, I'm not going to repeat it, in so, death by lung cancer. Yes, so, so this raises not only interesting information about new thinking about targets to manage atherothrombosis, atherosclerosis, but also cancer and perhaps the, uh, the migration, perhaps the metastases of cancer. And there's good biology behind that, isn't there? Yes, there is, again, biologies and there are hypotheses that have been uh, put forward to indicate that, again, this pathway is involved in cancer. But again, it has not been tested. 
And uh, in, in some other cases, people have advocated that increasing the inflammatory response could be beneficial in cancer. So it depends, again, what kind of cancer, you know, like squamous cellular carcinoma of the lung, you know, there is an inflammatory chronic inflammation uh, pathogenesis. And in those cases... So Kentos, uh, a game changer in our understanding, uh, even though not a change in mortality, but perhaps points to the future. Uh, Stefan, what else excited you in that hotline? Well, there were two more exciting trials, personally, that I think will be extremely relevant. And uh, one is Castle AF, different topic. It's talking about AFib ablation and its influence on mortality. And the other one, obviously, once again, going towards prevention is uh, the COMPASS trial, uh, which looked at the question... Well, let's, let's talk about Castle AF okay. first. Yeah, if, sure. if, I, if I'd asked you, before you were unblinded to the results, would you expect that AF ablation would have an impact such that, uh, you know, five years later, 60% of people are in sinus rhythm? Would you have expected that? Well, there's two things that I would not have expected. First of all, uh, that in this challenging patient population, don't forget, these were all patients with heart failure. With heart failure. Reduced yeah, injection nice fraction. Yes. They all had ICDs implanted, mm -hmm. so these were severe heart failure patients. So I would not have expected that the procedure is as effective in this high-risk patient groups. And even though I would say if AFib ablation has a positive effect on outcomes, it would be in the high-risk patients, um, I would not have expected this result. We have a positive result. We have a positive long-term outcome result. We have an influence on mortality. Um, so that's something that is really, really um, tremendously important and something that deserves to really, really closely look at the results. Yes, and uh, you know, the, the point was raised in the discussion that we've got to be careful that maybe not every center can replicate uh, the very high success rate and low rate of complications. So we, we need to be aware of that. Absolutely. As in any trial, I would yes, say. Yes, as in any, any trial. We haven't seen the detail because it hasn't, it hasn't been published yet. We, yeah. Let's remember also that is a small trial. Okay. And so there may be a winner's curse okay. uh, effect. A winner's curse? Yes. So, Barbara, is it a winner's curse to stop a trial prematurely, like Compass? <laughs> I think, yeah, I, I'm always feeling slightly upset because, you know, there is so much has been invested uh, and then uh, to actually stop it because, uh, yes, there is a comparison that is highly significant, you know, river oxygen plus uh, aspirin is superior to aspirin alone, but there is also the comparison of river oxygen versus aspirin on its own that has remained, you know, a little bit in a limbo. You know, yes. it hasn't been fully developed by the fact that the... Uh, and in fact, if that trial had run to, to its planned duration, we may have got clearer signals. Exactly. So we are still now by, you know, a little extra effort would have given us so much more information. Okay. And, and, uh, and is it ethical to continue if a, a trial is, um, you know, uh, four standard deviations positive? Well, I, I do think that particularly if you consider safety, that it is ethical. I it mean, is ethical. this is a, 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 a regime that is not without... Uh, there was increased bleeding. Yes, there is increased bleeding, increased significant bleeding, the increase in, 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 in uh, you know, severe bleeding. But no increase in fatal bleeding or critical organ ble bleeding. Well, but, you know, for how long? You know, I mean, as people get older, uh, then this may change. Yes. Uh, and uh, the, there is an excess in hemorrhagic stroke, yes. for instance, uh, even though, you know, in the, in the uh, dual regime, for instance, and maybe or maybe not uh, uh, visible, it would have been visible uh, in, in the river oxygen. Maybe the river oxygen alone would have had perhaps a better safety profile and end up having the same effect over time. I mean, uh, maybe but, even but, if... But, yeah, I, I yeah. think, I mean, it's good to look at these critical points, but we should not forget over this no. that this trial really opens the door in a completely yes. new direction. Yes. It, it opens the door, and perhaps one of the most impressive things is in the peripheral arterial population, where, and we've got to remember this trial had a reduction, I've got to declare an interest as I was co-chair of the trial in, in deaths overall and cardiovascular deaths, but also, you know, perhaps our peripheral arterial patients have not been well treated in the past, 
and saving limb amputations and major limb complications is a step. Absolutely, no question. Uh, now, yeah, I declare uh, an interest as well, and I, as you know, I am interested in atrial fibrillation. Yes. So at the moment, there is a huge debate as to whether it's worthwhile or not yes. to screen the population for silent atrial fibrillation. Yes. So in the uh, uh, anticoagulant uh, and aspirin combined, rivaroxaban, there is a, a very significant reduction in the composite endpoint that is massively driven by a reduction in ischemic stroke. Yes. So it makes you believe that maybe treating patients with silent IF with an ACNOAC <laughs> may be a good idea. It may be worthwhile. I mean, yeah. what you're what you explaining I mean, here is yeah. that we're looking at a very high-risk population. Yes. PAD yes. patients are typically very high-risk yes. patients. But, but, but you know, you say it's very high-risk, but these are also patients who were CAD several years after yes. their last treatment, yes. apparently yes. stable. Apparently yes, stable. apparently stable. Okay. And that's, yeah. makes, that's what makes the trial really impressive because you always think after the event you have a high risk for a few years and then the risk basically goes down to something that is not yeah. terribly high. Yeah. But this is why this trial so is So despite the cu on current therapy. So um, yeah. there have also been a couple of important guidelines. Can you just mention one or two key take-home messages from the guidelines presented today? Well, I think we're getting, uh, we have two guidelines that we presented today. ST elevation, acute myocardial infarction, and dual antiplatelet therapy. If I would just like to highlight two points, clarifications maybe. For example, uh, in acute myocardial infarction, use the radial axis. It has a class one indication now. Um, so that is something that is very, very clear advice. In the dual antiplatelet, it's a focused update. It's not really a guideline, but in this very important paper, I was impressed by the clarity that it gives you regarding clinical recommendations of what to do. For example, there is very clear instructions of if you want to switch from one to the other, for some reason it gives you exactly you know, when to stop one and start with the other at what dose, and this is exactly the sort yep. of instructions we need for this complex so topic. So clear clinical guidance. Absolutely. So um, we've had some really exciting information. We've moved from a time when commentators have said cardiology is going through the doldrums. Mm. We're in exciting times. I think this is the forefront of some changes in our understanding. So Barbara and Stefan, thank you very much. And from the ESC TV today, thank you.